Over 20 billion kilometres from the Sun, in the outer reaches of our solar system, past the point where interstellar winds overpower the suns, you will find two small spacecraft. These two spacecraft have been venturing into the void for over 45 years, and have revolutionised our understanding of our solar system more so than almost any other mission. My name is Thomas Rintoul. These are the Voyager spacecraft, our vanguard to the cosmos. Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 launched in August and September of 1977, but the genesis of the programme took place more than a decade earlier, with the proposal of the Grand Tour programme by JPL engineer Gary Flandreau. In his 1964 paper, Flandreau identified that in the late 1970s there would be an alignment of four of the then five outer planets that would allow one spacecraft to visit all the outer planets of our solar system. This was an event that would take place only once every 175 years. Two years later, JPL, the Jet Propulsion Lab, were actively promoting this project, touting the cost benefits of sending one spacecraft to multiple planets over individual missions. It took some time, but NASA did eventually come around to the idea of targeting this once in a lifetime opportunity. In 1969, NASA founded the Outer Planets Working Group, part of a large restructuring of the agency under NASA Associate Administrator Homer Newell. Newell wanted NASA to better develop long-term plans, rather than to continue focusing on the space race with the Soviets. Newell's new Outer Planets Working Group was comprised of two representatives from each of the NASA field centres interested in Outer Planets missions like the Grand Tour. This included JPL. It also included two representatives from the Illinois Institute of Technology's Astro Sciences Centre, essentially a NASA think tank. The group would come to recommend multiple flyby missions, each visiting multiple planets, rather than one mission taking advantage of the unique alignment to visit all of the outer planets. The preferred solution was two three-planet missions. After consulting external scientists, NASA decided they would request funding for the Grand Tour program in 1971. But that budget request was not so simple. Richard Nixon had just been elected as President of the United States, and he saw NASA as something to be cut back. Unlike his predecessors, Nixon didn't see space exploration as a way to compete with the Soviets. He saw the Apollo missions, and by extension NASA, in partisan terms, as a Kennedy project. Following intense budget cuts, NASA looked to prioritise. Naturally, the Outer Planets Working Group would encourage them not to cancel the Grand Tour project. However, the issue of cost kept rearing its ugly head. The proposed missions were going to be expensive. The probes involved in the Grand Tour project had to be able to endure for a very long time, and to be able to function very far from Earth, where solar power was going to be practically impossible. The probes were going to have to endure for a long time, and to be capable enough to function very far from Earth, where solar power would be practically impossible. JPL's proposal was called TOPS, the Thermoelectric Outer Planets spacecraft, and they were going to cost $106 million each. Some NASA scientists were sceptical, rather favouring smaller, less costly missions. Others were worried that spending so much on the Grand Tour programme would divert money away from a new large space telescope. Eventually all of this discourse happening behind closed doors at NASA would be leaked to the papers, entering the public and political spheres as well. After months of wrangling by all parties, the final decision of what to do about the Grand Tour would come to new NASA Administrator James Fletcher. Fletcher had heard from the White House that the Nixon administration were willing to fund the Space Shuttle program, NASA's next major human space flight initiative, and that they were willing to fund the Grand Tour program but not at its current expense. Fletcher had to make a decision. Human spaceflight or Grand Tour? Eventually, Fletcher came down on the side of human spaceflight, downgrading the Grand Tour program proposal from four missions with JPL's TOPS spacecraft to two missions with much cheaper spacecraft based on the Mariner design that had been used to explore the inner solar system. This mission would come to be known as Mariner Jupiter Saturn. For now,
With Mariner Jupiter Saturn approved, it was time to get to work. The probes were still to be built by JPL, and while their stated mission aims and therefore associated cost calculations were only to visit Jupiter and Saturn, they would be designed and built with the intention that they could last long enough to complete the original grand tour. The two probes were to visit Jupiter, Saturn and Saturn's moon Titan. NASA conceived of two trajectories, JST and JSX. JST was seen as the primary trajectory, designed to visit Jupiter, Saturn and to optimise that flyby of Titan. JSX was more of a wish list trajectory. It would still visit Jupiter and Saturn, but would preserve the option of completing the Grand Tour by allowing visits to Uranus and Neptune later. But if something went wrong and the JST spacecraft failed to launch successfully, the second spacecraft could be diverted to do the Titan flyby instead. With the trajectory selected and the possible visits to the ice giants in the back of the minds of those engineers at JPL, it was time to get to work designing the spacecrafts. It was known that the spacecraft would be based on the Mariner designs, but it wasn't as simple as building another Mariner 10 and hurling it at the outer solar system. The Mariner probes were designed to function in the inner solar system, studying Mercury, Venus and Mars, and they were all solar powered. That wasn't going to cut it the further out in the solar system these probes went. Instead, these probes would be equipped with three radioisotope thermoelectric generators, essentially big boxes of plutonium-238 with thermocouples attached. The plutonium would decay, letting out heat, and the thermocouples would turn that heat into electricity. At the time of launch, these RTGs would provide around 470 watts of power to each spacecraft, and it was known that this power output would decay over time, but that it would last a lot longer than solar power would be practical in the outer solar system. The rest of the spacecraft would essentially be taken up by the propulsion system and the over 100 kilograms of scientific equipment chosen by committee after over 200 experimental submissions were made to NASA for consideration. There isn't time to go through every instrument selected for the mission in this video, but if you want, there's a summary on screen now which you can pause and read over if you're interested. However, regardless of the science missions selected, JPL insisted that the probes be equipped with video cameras, recognising both the scientific and non-scientific benefits of capturing images of the outer solar system. With the instruments selected and the designs finalised, the probes were built. And they were light, especially considering the mission they were about to undertake. Each probe weighed less than a Mark I Volkswagen Golf on sale when they were launched, and the pair combined is barely heavier than a modern Golf. We had our Mariner Jupiter Saturn probes. Or did we? In March 1977, a few months before Mariner Jupiter Saturn was due to launch, scientists working on the project had come to the conclusion that the mission had diverged sufficiently from the original Mariner missions to justify a name change. NASA opened a competition to rename the project, and from this competition came the name that is perhaps more famous than Mariner ever was. Voyager. New name in place, it was time to launch. With the Voyager probes slated to take two different trajectories, they couldn't launch together. Voyager 2 taking the slower, more circular route confusingly had to launch first, and then Voyager 1 launched second. On the 20th of August 1977, Voyager 2 launched from Launch Complex 41 at Cape Canaveral, Florida. A few weeks later, on the 5th of September, Voyager 1 would follow it, once again from Launch Complex 41. Voyager 2's launch went off without a hitch. Voyager 1's nearly ended in disaster. The problem in the Voyager 1 launch lay in the upper stage of the Titan Centaur launch vehicle. What happened was that the liquid upper stage cut off early, with about 500 kilograms of unburnt fuel remaining. This led the third stage to have to do a much, much longer burn, using way more fuel than had been anticipated. In the end, it was fine. Voyager 1 made it to orbit and onto its trajectory over to Jupiter. But as Charlie Collis, the former manager of the Voyager mission, would tell Space.com in 2012, it was close. There was only 3.4 seconds of fuel left in that third stage. Close crisis averted, the Voyagers were on their way to Jupiter. Voyager 1 taking a more direct route, with Voyager 2 taking a more curved circular path. The journey to Jupiter would take about 18 months. In this time, they'd pass the orbit of Mars and through the asteroid belt. 
Fortunately, the asteroid belt is not as dense as movies always portray them. The Voyager probes were not having to do Millennium Falcon style evasive manoeuvres. In their year in the asteroid belt, Voyager 1 would overtake Voyager 2 in December of 1977, and on their emergence in September and October of 1978, the Voyagers would leave behind the inner solar system, entering the realm of their primary mission, the outer solar system. March 1979, Voyager 1 arrives in the Jovian system. Not the first probe to be here, and it will be far from the last. Voyager 1 will spend just over a month in the Jovian system, but it isn't really here for sightseeing. It will do flybys of the four Galilean moons as well as Amalthea, but it's really here for Jupiter, specifically to get a gravity assist. Gravity assist, also known as a slingshot manoeuvre, is a tool that a spacecraft can use to get a speed boost from something like a planet, a moon, a star, really any massive body. Conversely, they can also be used to slow down. A gravity assist, rather unsurprisingly, relies on gravity, as well as on the law of conservation of momentum. Gravity is one of the fundamental forces of our universe, every particle of matter exerting an attractive force on every other particle of matter. Without gravity, there would be no stars, no planets, no life. Gravity is that fundamental. And this fundamental force also holds the key to the outer solar system. They are the special sauce of the Grand Tour alignment, they're what makes it so unique. So what is a gravity assist? Well when the Voyager probes come close to another massive body, in this case Jupiter, they enter what's called its gravitational field. They enter the region where its gravity is dominant. So let's consider the Jovian system, which I've set up in an early version of my n-body gravity simulator, Nessie. As Voyager approaches Jupiter from the inner solar system, as we expect, Jupiter's gravity takes hold. Voyager 1 speeds up, getting closer and closer to Jupiter, building up speed, its path being altered, and it flies off in a different trajectory. But what's that? Why is the final speed the same as the initial speed? Well, that's because gravity is a conservative force. In the vacuum of space there will be nothing to remove energy from the system. Voyager is able to pass right by Jupiter, have its path altered, and by the time it reaches the same distance from Jupiter it started from, it will be going at the same speed. But this doesn't make sense. Isn't the whole point of a gravity assist to get a speed boost? Why is the Voyager probe going at the same speed? What are we missing here? What we are missing is that Jupiter is also moving. In this example, Jupiter has no momentum of its own. So let's change that. Let's set up the system so that Jupiter is moving relative to the Sun. Now Jupiter is moving relative to the Sun, Voyager 1 once again approaches from the inner solar system, getting closer to Jupiter, and now, when it leaves, it does so much faster. As Voyager entered Jupiter's gravitational pull, Jupiter pulled it along with it. It spent more time trying to speed Voyager up than it did trying to slow it down as it sped off into the outer solar system. This small transfer of momentum from Jupiter to Voyager gave it a net speed boost, sending it on its way to explore the outer solar system. Having got what it came for, Voyager 1 left the Jovian system in April 1979. But we're not quite done with Jupiter yet. Voyager 2 is arriving a couple of weeks later. Voyager 2's visit to the Jovian system took a bit longer than Voyager 1, its path designed to be a bit slower. In this visit to the Jovian system, it would do much closer flybys to several of Jupiter's moons than Voyager 1 had. When Voyager 1 had passed through the system, it had taken images which suggested that there was active volcanoes on Io. This was the first discovery of active volcanism on another celestial body other than Earth. We knew volcanoes had existed elsewhere, such as Olympus Mons on Mars, but nothing current. The original discovery of volcanism on Io was made by Linda Morabito, at the time a technician at JPL, much to the embarrassment of the full-time scientists who'd overlooked this discovery. Voyager 2 was tasked with follow-up observations. This would involve a 10-hour volcano watch on Io. This confirmed Morabito's initial discovery, and in fact, eight of the nine volcanoes she identified were still erupting by the time Voyager 2 arrived, and there was evidence of other volcanism in the intervening time as well. 
data on this volcanism would go on to show that activity on Io affects the entire Jovian system. It acts as the primary source of material found in Jupiter's magnetosphere, the area where Jupiter's magnetic field dominates the activity of other charged particles. Io was spewing out large quantities of sulphur, oxygen and sodium to have electrons stripped off by highly ionising radiation from the Sun. This would then be found in the magnetosphere of Jupiter. Before leaving the Jovian system behind, Voyager would take images of several of Jupiter's moons, including Callisto, Ganymede and particularly Europa. Images from Voyager 1 had shown dark streaks on the surface of Europa, but it couldn't resolve them. Since it was passing much closer, Voyager 2 was able to resolve these streaks as deep dark cracks in the icy smooth crust of Europa. It turned out that these cracks were a result of tidal heating of the Moon by Jupiter. Tidal heating is another process that results from gravity. If we say a force is tidal, we mean that it exerts more force on one side of an object than the other. Gravity depends on distance. The side closest to Jupiter will feel more gravitational pull than the side further away. If you have a moon orbiting in an elliptical orbit rather than a circular one, that force of gravity will act on different parts of the moon, stretching it and squeezing it as it moves around its orbit. That causes frictional heating on the inside of the moon, as well as stresses and strains on the crust. This frictional heating allows a liquid ocean to exist underneath an icy crust, and those stresses and strains cause the cracks we observed in Europa's crust. The discovery of tidal heating on Europa was one of the most important discoveries in our search for life beyond Earth. The moons of Jupiter and Saturn are some of the best candidates for microbial life elsewhere in the solar system. We haven't found it yet, but NASA's Europa Clipper mission, due for launch in October 2024, is designed to tell us more about this moon and help us understand if life could possibly exist beneath its icy crust. With both voyagers gaining gravity assists from Jupiter, they left the Jovian system behind and travelled onward to Saturn. Voyager 1 would arrive in November 1980, and Voyager 2 pulling up the rear in August 1981. Saturn and its moon Titan were some of the primary targets of the Voyager mission. But before we talk about Titan, let's talk about Saturn. While Saturn isn't the only planet to have rings, Jupiter, Uranus and Neptune all have at least one. Saturns are by far the most magnificent. They were first discovered back in 1610 by Galileo Galilei, one year after he developed his telescope. In 1655, the Dutch astronomer Christian Huygens would go on to describe them as a disc for the first time. Later, in 1676, Giovanni Cassini would identify this gap in the rings, a gap that would go on to be called the Cassini Division. Turning our eyes to the planet itself, Saturn is a gas giant, much like Jupiter, primarily composed of hydrogen and helium. Where Jupiter is known for some fantastic cloud formations, notably its great red spot, Saturn has some wonderfully interesting ones as well. Most notably, this one, the Saturn Hexagon, a persistent hexagonal cloud formation at its north pole. The exact origins of the Saturn Hexagon aren't fully understood, but it's thought to arise from jet stream travelling at 320 kilometres per hour, or around 200 miles per hour. But let's return to the Voyagers, specifically Voyager 1 and its flyby of Titan. Titan had been selected because it was the only known moon to have an atmosphere, and back in the early 70s it was thought that it may possibly be able to support life. A year prior to Voyager 1's arrival, Pioneer 11 had taken observations of Titan, and established that it was probably a bit too cold to support life. But this didn't diminish Voyager 1's contribution. The Voyager images far surpassed the Pioneer images right off the bat. But Voyager 1 had a couple of other tricks up its sleeve with doing a flyby this close to Titan. As Voyager 1 passed by Titan, its path was altered, a slightly less useful gravity assist. By examining the trajectory changes of Voyager 1, this allowed NASA scientists to determine the mass of Titan, and then by studying the effects on the radio signal by the atmosphere, they were able to determine its atmospheric composition, the pressure of the atmosphere, and its density, all things that Pioneer 11 couldn't do. 
Unfortunately, Titan has a very thick, hazy atmosphere, so we weren't able to get images of the surface from Voyager 1. That would have to wait for the Cassini Hawkins mission, which I have made a video about, and it'll be in the top right hand corner and linked in the video description below if you'd like to see that. The determination to get a good flyby of Titan meant that Voyager 1's path would take it under the south pole of Saturn. This gravity assist was not particularly useful for looking at the outer solar system, as it would take Voyager 1 up out of the plane of the solar system. This ended Voyager 1's planetary mission. So let's talk about Voyager 2. Unlike Voyager 1, Voyager 2 would spend most of its Saturnian encounter studying Saturn itself. While it's less flashy than a Titan flyby, Voyager 2 would do very important mapping of temperature and pressure in Saturn's atmosphere. Probing Saturn's atmosphere with radio waves, Voyager 2 discovered some incredible variations in pressure and temperature in the Saturnian atmosphere. Much like our atmosphere, Saturn has a troposphere and a stratosphere. The shape of the temperature profiles in these sections of Saturn's atmosphere are very similar to the temperature profiles in the atmosphere of Earth. If you want a better description of this, then I recommend this amazing video by Dr. Simon Clark on what happens if you go up. All this information about Saturn's atmosphere is incredibly useful, but we should have had a lot more. During the encounter with Saturn, Voyager 2's rotatable camera platform got stuck for a couple of days. This meant we lost out on a good chunk of observing time we just couldn't get back. Fortunately, this came back online later, which was just as well, because Voyager 2 isn't done yet. Not needing the close flyby of Titan, Voyager 2 was able to get a gravity assist from Saturn keeping it within the plane of our solar system. This allowed it to be sent onwards to Uranus and Neptune, the ice giants. Leaving Saturn behind, Voyager 2 had two more planetary destinations, Uranus and Neptune. This is where Voyager 2 would really start writing the books, because no probe had ever been sent to Uranus or Neptune before, and as of time of recording, none have been sent since. It took Voyager 2 four years to travel from Saturn to Uranus, and on arrival it was worth it. Being able to study Uranus up close rather than from afar with space telescopes allowed us to discover 11 new moons, as well as to examine what we thought would be the most interesting part of the Uranian system, Uranus's magnetic field. Uranus is unlike the other planets in the solar system. Rather than spinning like a slightly misaligned spinning top going around their orbits like the other planets, Uranus rolls around its orbit. Its spin axis is misaligned by about 98 degrees. Since we've been able to study the magnetic fields of other planets in our solar system, which have their spin axis and their magnetic field aligned with each other, we assumed that Uranus would be the same, so we'd be presenting its magnetic north pole to the solar wind. This would mean that Uranus would be very interesting, because it would have a very unusual magnetosphere. However, the Voyagers have always been the ones to surprise, and what we found looked very familiar. The magnetosphere of Uranus wasn't that different from Earth. Rather than having its magnetic field aligned with its spin axis, Voyager 2 found that it was misaligned, so the magnetic field stuck up and down out of the plane of the orbit, while the spin axis was completely misaligned to this. This is unlike any other planet in our solar system. After Uranus, Voyager 2 travelled onto Neptune, where it discovered previously unknown rings around that planet that necessitated a course correction. Unfortunately, this led to more distant flybys of Neptune and its moon, Triton. Despite this, Voyager 2 gained valuable information about the system. It found an incredibly dynamic atmosphere on Neptune, far more dynamic than we would expect given it only receives 3% of the sunlight and therefore solar heating that Jupiter does. We found that Neptune has the strongest winds in the solar system, three times as strong as Jupiter and nine times stronger than the strongest winds on Earth. Cloud decks were seen to circle the planet in 16 to 18 hours, and we discovered a massive anti-cyclone dubbed the Great Dark Spot, similar to Jupiter's Great Red Spot. However, these storms are not as persistent as those on Jupiter. Hubble imagery from 1994 showed that the Great Dark Spot had already dissipated by that time. And the flyby of Triton showed that the moon had once been very active. With active geysers, it showed polar ice caps and nitrogen clouds, only possible because this far from the sun, it is very, very cold.
Voyager 2's trajectory around Neptune would alter its path in a way that took it out of the plane of the solar system, precluding any visit to Pluto. Both the Voyagers were now headed into the outer reaches of the solar system. In 1990, Voyager 1 would complete the family portrait of the solar system after it moved beyond Neptune's orbit, NASA combining many images into one. In 1998, Voyager 1 overtook Pioneer 10 to become the most distant spacecraft ever built by humans. Voyager 2 would complete this feat in 2023. Pioneer 10 is heading in the opposite direction to the Voyager probes, heading into the tail of the sun's magnetic field. The Voyager probes, on the other hand, are making a beeline for the heliopause, the point where the interstellar medium will overpower the solar wind. In 2004, Voyager 1 began to enter this region, when it crossed the termination shock, the point where the solar wind goes from supersonic to subsonic. Once it crossed that termination shock, Voyager 1 entered the heliosheath, a mixing layer between the interstellar medium and the solar wind. In June 2012, Voyager 1 would detect a marked increase in charged particles, showing it had crossed the heliopause and entered interstellar space. Voyager 2 would follow it into interstellar space in 2018. This isn't to say that the Voyagers have left the solar system. They will still be in the region where the Sun is the dominant gravitational force for another 50,000 years or so until they clear the Oort cloud. And despite operating for over 45 years, the Voyager probes are still going, still collecting data, still sending us information from the furthest reaches we've been able to send something. But they won't last forever. One day, they will go dark. As of now, the Voyager probes are receiving about 57% as much power as they were at launch. The plutonium in their radioisotope thermoelectric generators is decaying, and the thermocouples that convert that heat into electricity are degrading as we knew they would. To conserve power, NASA deactivated the entirety of Voyager 2's scan platform. They deactivated most of Voyager 1's as well, with the exception of the ultraviolet spectrometer, which is still being used to study some ultraviolet emission from beyond the heliopause. The rest of the scientific instruments are still running, but they're on a reduced service. NASA estimates that the Voyager probes have enough power and enough attitude control propellant to continue operating until at least 2025, but eventually, the power provided by the RTGs will not be enough to continue scientific operation. At this point, data collection will cease, as will spacecraft operation. And one day soon, we will lose both Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 to the depths of space. Forever. At least until one of them falls into a wormhole, encounters an alien race, gets upgraded and sent back to us looking for its creator, in the process of which it will kill some Klingons. Wait, hang on, Star Trek The Motion Picture is not a documentary. Now, I made joke about V'ger from Star Trek The Motion Picture, but it's impossible to deny the impact the Voyager has had on us, not just scientifically, but culturally. JPL had the right idea when they insisted on video cameras being added to the Voyager probes. The images that Voyager collected of Uranus and Neptune are still the closest and best that we have of these planets. JWST images are nice, but they're nothing compared to up close and personal. And to this day, no spacecraft has given us information from beyond the solar wind. Pioneers 10 and 11 are going in completely the wrong direction. Everything we know about that environment comes from voyagers. And despite the wealth of planetary information all being collected before 1990, Voyager data is still leading to new discoveries, a perfect example being this paper where they discovered a plasmoid, a magnetic bubble arising from Uranus, from Voyager 2 data, and this paper was published in 2020. While there are many tangible ways to measure the impact of the Voyager missions, number of scientists who worked on it, number of papers published, amount of data collected, there's also all the intangible benefits, the wider legacy of Voyager. There's the impact that Voyager has had on future space missions like Juno, like Cassini Huygens, like New Horizons. And then there are the golden records, phonograph records attached to the side of each of the Voyager spacecraft, carrying messages from Earth and Chuck Berry recordings for some alien species that might someday intercept one of them. Those records aren't just a message, they're a record of us, of our hope that we're not alone in this universe. And then there's the impact the Voyagers had on us, on our culture. I mentioned one of them before, Star Trek The Motion Picture. The creators of that movie thought Voyager was so important that we might launch six of them. Voyager 6. 
and Star Trek would go on later to name an entire series after Voyager. And then there are the thousands of images that made it into newspapers, that made it onto classroom walls and into science textbooks, that inspired people to become interested in astronomy, that inspired a generation of kids, multiple generations of kids, to become scientists. Hey, I'm one of them. I'm as old now as the Voyager probes were when I was born. Yes, one day the Voyagers will go dark. We'll lose them to the vastness of space. But what a mission, what an impact what a legacy they've left for our small, pale blue dot. This video was not sponsored by Notion, but I am a Notion affiliate. They get no say in my videos, I just love their product. I've been using Notion for years now through my undergraduate, and now I use it primarily for content creation. I get the benefits of their Education Plus plan because I'm at university, but even if I had to pay for it, I couldn't highly recommend the Plus plan enough. Notion is infinitely customizable, it's a productivity tool if you haven't used it before. If you are using it and you'd like to upgrade to the Plus plan, a business plan, or to any of the Notion AI plans, then please use the link in the description below and I get a small commission on any purchases made if you follow that link. And if you're a student, you get all of that for free. Affiliate plug aside, thank you very much for watching this first episode in what I intend to be a series on humanity's legendary space missions. I really want this to be a great series for everyone, so please leave your comments below. I'd love your feedback, what you liked, what you didn't like, any missions you'd like me to cover. The sources I used in this video are linked in the description below, and any scientific papers I've referenced are also linked down there, free to read by anyone. If you're new to the channel, I'd really appreciate it if you could subscribe and hit the bell icon. But the best thing that everyone can do is share this video with a friend. Share the love of space, share the love of the Voyagers. If you're looking for something else to watch, then I highly recommend one of my earlier videos on the cassini Huygens mission. I'm going to apologise that I really mispronounced it. I used the Huygens pronunciation in that video. I have since been corrected and I've tried to say it right. Thank you, Roman, for help with that pronunciation. Roman's one of my moderators on Twitch. All that's left to say is thank you very much for watching this video all the way to the end. I really hope you enjoyed it and I'll see you in my next video. See ya.